Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Television Podcast. Last week, for some reason, my mouth called it the GFMC Television Podcast. I've never been diagnosed with dyslexia or anything like that, but I experienced something at times, so I think I'll start calling this show the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. And we are part of the mighty Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, and I'm your oratorically challenged host, Howard Fletcher. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. If you've never been here before, welcome back. You know what to expect. I'll try to do better. <laughs> and if you're here for the first time, stick around. I think you'll like what you hear, if I'm making sense today. Now, for those of you who tuned in last week, you can remember that my pug, Jack, was making a video of me with his iPhone. And we were going to use it as a pilot for my reality show, Howard's half-assed podcast show, but he's still learning the equipment, so I have nothing to submit to TLC, Discovery, or Bravo yet, but we're going to work on it. Stay tuned. We have some tweaks to make, so Jack, maybe next week. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, it, it, let me start off by talking about the cast of Friends, okay? Friends, as I've said on the show before, not one of my favorite shows, a show that I think I've only watched one complete episode of. The cast of Friends is going to be there for you, but not at the launch of HBO Max in May. Now, according to people who have knowledge of this situation, none of whom I spoke to, but The Hollywood Reporter and Variety did speak to some of these people. They said because of the continued production shutdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic, uh, Warner Media has been unable to film the show's, quote unquote, highly anticipated, unscripted, Reunion special. So the special is not going to be available at the launch of the Friends series on the streaming service as they planned. While some shows have taken to filming remotely using video technology like Zoom, the sources that they spoke to said that they're not going to do that with this Friends special because they wanted to uh, film it on the original soundstage on the Warner Brothers studio in Burbank. I guess that's that fake apartment that's supposed to be in New York where there are nobody but people who look like the Friends cast. Yes, sir. But since we're all staying socially distanced, they're not going to be able to do that. However, all 10 seasons of the beloved series will be available to stream whenever the service debuts, HBO Max, that is, next month. Now, Variety reported on March 18th that production on the special, which was due to take place the following week, had been postponed amid a wave of production shutdowns caused by the pandemic. I told you about that on this show. The Friends reunion has been in the works for months now, but was officially announced in February. Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, Matthew Perry, and David Schwimmer are all set to return for an unscripted reunion. Now, they keep calling it an unscripted reunion, so I'm not sure whether these people are going to be playing their roles in this apartment set, or I thought it was just going to be like an interview, in which case interviews are usually by definition unscripted. So I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Maybe they're just going to be doing an improv set because they're such highly talented comedians and actors. Yes, sir. Warner Media reportedly paid over $400 million for the streaming rights for Friends, and they outbid Netflix. Netflix knew what they were doing. Now, Friends has been on Netflix, so that's one reason probably why they didn't want to pay any more money. Nielsen had previously reported that the show was one of the most watched on Netflix, though Netflix does not provide any viewership data. 
Yeah, I I just think that if anyone was going to get Netflix because Friends is on it, they are already had they already have Netflix, and if anybody decides they're going to cancel their Netflix subscription and get an HBO Max subscription because they're not going to be able to watch reruns of Friends anymore, email me for a referral for a therapist. As of this date, HBO Max does not have an official launch date. The service will be home to a wide range of programming under the Warner Media umbrella, including Friends, The Big Bang Theory, HBO series and films, and films from the Warner Brothers Library. I think HBO Max is going to be one of the better streaming services. Just, I just hope no one's getting it because they want to see Friends. Yes, sir. Here's some breaking email news. I got another email from my man Tyrion Lannister from Westeros. Just a few hours ago, so I will read it. As a, If you're new to the show, I read all my emails. You want to email me, email me at podcasthoward at gmail.com, and I will read it. Tyrion takes full advantage of that. He writes, Howard, I'm writing you again. I wasn't planning on it, but you went on a rant about a Doogie Hauser reboot last episode. No one cares about a Doogie Hauser reboot. I know you seem, it seemed to irk you because you don't like reboots, but nobody cares. Just thought you ought to know. Keep up the bad work. Your level of stupidity is consistent. Fine job. Best regards, the imp. Thank you, Tyrion. I appreciate all your emails. Keep them coming, and I will keep reading them. I got another email from Jenny. Jenny's from Gaffney, South Carolina, where they have that giant peach water pump I used to pass going to college. And this is what Jenny writes. Howard, thank you for bringing up the subject of media companies creating false diversity by just painting an established white character, yellow, black, or brown. I'm always pointing this out to my friends and whoever else will listen, but most people have little to say about it. It was refreshing to hear someone else has the same concerns about how people of color are portrayed in the media. I appreciate when creators take the time to create a fully fleshed out character who is something other than white, a white male or an alien. Keep up the good work. I'll be back. Jenny. Well, Jenny from Gaffney, uh, I appreciate the email. I appreciate the compliments. Thank you for listening. I do want to say for the purposes of this program is that I, I do, I'm making those comments not to be a social justice warrior. This isn't that type of program. While my views and my politics probably correlate with people who identify themselves as SJWs more often than not, that's simply not why I was bringing it up. I was bringing it up in the context of creativity and audience. See, I don't want creators to get lazy, and I believe that's what they're doing whenever they're rebooting a successful series or one that was moderately successful and deciding we're just going to take the lead character and make them a different sex or a different color or a different sexual orientation, and that'll be good. Boom. I just don't want them to be lazy because there's audiences out there like myself, like the people listening to this program, who are eager for new content, who will give it a chance. And so since we're investing our time and we're investing our money a lot of times and we're paying for these streaming services, you can at least put forth the effort to do the same and create an original character with an original backstory. Don't take your audiences for granted. Just keep reaching out for the new. That's all I'm saying. That's where the best stories are found. Okay, that's it for that. Thank you for the emails. Keep on writing them, and I'll keep on reading them. One of the things you might find if you listen to the show on a regular basis, which I hope you do, is that your boy Howard here can be a complete hypocrite. And so while I was just giving my soapbox speech about how to reach out for the new, I'm about to go back into the Tiger King well. Yeah, once again, we're going to talk about Tiger King next segment. While I wish I could talk about something else, this story is like the cockroach of stories. It's the zombie of stories. It just will never die. Whenever I think, okay, this is just going to be a flukish thing that was on Netflix, something else comes out and something else comes out. So when I come back, another Tiger King story, you know my recommendation for these. Go pour yourself a stiff one, sit back, and just listen to this nonsense I'm going to have right after this. Don't go away. Yes, sir. I'd do anything for him. I'd submit to him. 
Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Okay. Yeah, I like spicy chicken. Ah, Mild to get that. Okay. I am back and we're about to do what I warned you about. I'm going to talk about Tiger King. Now, John Finlay, that was Joe Exotic's first husband, I believe. Yes. The first husband we were told about as an audience when uh, in the show. He's the guy who had about three teeth. Dude was an interesting looking cat, to say the least. He had an interview with Variety. So the following is going is are bits and pieces that I pulled out of the interview that are question and answers between the reporter and John Finley, the toothless ex-husband of Joe Exotic. So here are some of the questions and answers I thought you might find interesting or entertaining, if nothing else. What do you want people to know about you that wasn't in the show? John Finley says, I've been six years clean since that was aired. I was never married to Joe or to my baby's mama. We're engaged now. I think her name is Stormy, by the way, with an E between the M and the Y. They never showed that because they knew I was engaged at the time. They never showed the tattoo fully done. They never showed what it was like to be around the animals or anything. They just focused on the drama. Okay. Now, yeah, I will tell you what I think about his answer, too. I mean, I hope he doesn't think that people really would want to watch him taking care of animals. With three teeth. I just don't think that's good television. Okay, the next question. What do you wish the series showed instead? I'd show more of the positive. They never showed that we helped quite a few people with their last dying wishes to be able to pet a tiger, pet a bear, pet a wolf. That gave me a different outlook on life. Why a lot of people do what they do before they go and where I needed to be. Okay, let me read that again. Why a lot of people do what they do before they go and where I needed to be. Okay, I still don't understand that. Well, again, they're not going to show somebody with their last dying wish to to pet a tiger or pet a bear or or a wolf and then go back to hospice. Again, not, not good television. Maybe good for you, John, but not good for the show. Now the question, when you look back on your time at the zoo, is it a positive memory? Yeah, because the animals are what everyone was really there for. It wasn't the human factors of it. The animals and the experience are what I've missed the most. Okay. I would imagine the animals are, were probably, you know, a big thing since that's where you spent your whole day. Um, I think Joe was there for more than the animals, though. But you probably were there for the animals. Next question. How many times were you interviewed for the show? At least five. Throughout the show, a lot of people focused on the one scene of me being shirtless. There were quite a few scenes throughout the whole thing where I had a shirt on. They suggested that I show the tattoos off. They kind of made me feel like I was the sexy one of the whole thing. Oh, John. You know, I don't want to clown this guy because I feel like the filmmakers clowned him and Joe, number one, was exploiting the dude. But man, John, it looks like you're, you were ripe for it. If you really thought coming, you know, hanging out with your three teeth and your shirt off with those, you know, tattoos, you know, and I laugh, I have tattoos. I'm not doubting the tattoos. I'm doubting your tattoos. Um, how you thought that you were like sexy. Damn. All right. Next question. How soon after the show ended did you get the new teeth? Cause he did get new teeth. I had them in June of 2019. I had the procedure and the teeth put in that same day. That, whoever that is, that dude deserves some sort of whatever prize you get because that was a job and a half. Well, actually, I don't know. It might have been easy. Just pull three teeth and stick the other other ones in. I don't know. What was more painful, the teeth 
or the tattoos. Okay. Now, as a journalist, I'm going to tell you this. As soon as he made that comment about being sexy, that's when the journalist said, this dude is a clown. I'm going to ask him questions that have nothing to do with anything but to hear what kind of garbage doesn't come out of his mouth. And this is what he said. The teeth were more painful. Okay. That's now you know. Next question. Would you participate if there was a follow-up to Tiger King? It would be nice, but that's totally up to Netflix. If it was shined in the right light and done the right way, possibly. If it's a season two, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay, let me let me clue John in real quick on something. If it's not a season two, nothing's happening. Okay, because Tiger King is the thing that people are watching. They're not going to watch John Finley, man with teeth, with unsexy, sexy tattoos. They're going to watch Tiger King too. So if you want to get paid by Netflix, you need to like erase all those conditions and just say yes. Here's a good question. Who do you think should play you if Tiger King was made into a movie? What advice would you give them? He says, (laughs) Channing Tatum is still number one. Shia LaBeouf is number two. And Tom Hardy is number three. Now I can see Tom Hardy playing that role. I can But Tom Hardy likes roles like that. It's pretty much just be yourself. Don't hold back. Have fun. Dude, man, he smoked a lot of meth. If he's like Channing Tatum, just be yourself. (laughs) That's what I'm like. You're like me. Wow. Okay. Anyway, I do think that Tom Hardy would be good in the role, but be nothing like him, but he would be good in the role. Next question. Joe's music videos have been stuck in people's heads since they watch the show. Are you a fan of his songs? No, I've heard those for years. I can't even stand to listen to them now. I wasn't really involved in too many, but it looks like I did. There were only maybe five that I was involved in. I mean, I know Joe has this huge library of music, but five is a lot, seems to me. Here's the question we all were asking. Do you think Carol Baskin killed her husband? I'm not going to speculate on whether she did it or not, because apparently... It's been reopened, meaning the case has been reopened. I don't speak negative on someone I don't know. Well, that was probably the most uh, intelligent answer he's given because, you know, with Carol Baskin, you can always end up as tiger meat if you don't watch out. Did you watch a lot of Netflix before the show came out? And did they give you a free account? No, I didn't even touch Netflix. I didn't pay attention to it at all. That that was kind of obvious from the show. I don't think these guys did much of anything but take care of those tigers. That would have been nice, but no, they didn't. They didn't give me a free account. You would think it, but I'm still paying the money for it. I'm watching Lucifer, which is actually a really good series, and the serial killer one where his sister's a cop. Yeah, Dexter. I always got to watch me some Dexter. Other than that, I'm watching movies like everyone else. I'd rather be outside doing something than being stuck inside. Well, there's nothing wrong with, even though this is a TV podcast, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to be in front of the television set if you're out doing something constructive. So that's good. I'm not surprised that Lucifer and Dexter top his list of Netflix offerings. So that's John Finley's answers to Variety's questions about his time filming Tiger King and what he's done, or a little bit of what he's done after since Um, I thought you might find that interesting. I find that interesting. That guy right there, John Finley, is the person who I think is probably the second most tragic person on the show besides uh, Joe's other husband who killed himself. Both of them, I think, were highly exploited. You know, in John's case, he was obviously a meth head. He smoked all the teeth out of his head. And uh, it looks like Joe Exotic preyed on that. So, um, I wish him the best. He's got some good teeth. They had a picture of him. If you go to variety.com, I think you can pull up a picture of him. You can probably pull up a picture anywhere if you just Google this guy's name. But he does look a lot different with teeth, like most of us would. So I wish him the best. And that's what I have for Tiger King. Again, I cannot promise you in good faith that this is the last you'll hear about Tiger King on this show. But I'll try to keep it at a bare minimum. Next I clown the show. I clown a lot of shows on this show, but I talk about The Walking Dead in not the highest regard, even though it's a very popular show. And it's not the show, because I haven't watched enough of the show to really credibly and honestly criticize the show or or be critical of the show. I'm just not a zombie guy, so I I think that kind of just 
takes me out of Walking Dead, period. However, there's an attraction at Universal Studios. It's a Walking Dead attraction. Found themselves or find themselves in a lawsuit. And I am going to tell you a little bit about the details of that because I don't know. I don't know why I find these things funny, but it just seems like these are the types of lawsuits that you can just see coming when you open it up. And when you come up with the idea to have this type of attraction, you know something like this is going to happen. So pour yourself a refill. Jack, let's try to film it again and be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, thank you very much. I am back. You all right? Okay. The Walking Dead is a show that has been hanging on for years and years, much like the zombies that star in it. And I've never really understood the attraction of The Walking Dead. Um, I've never really given it a chance, to be honest. I've had a lot of friends who say, you need to watch the show because... It's more that it has a lot more to do with it than there's a lot more going on than just zombies and people fighting them. And that's pro I know that's probably true. I say the same thing about my favorite show of all time, The Wire. It's a lot more, it's more than about drug dealing and the police. Like most things in media nowadays, especially if you're a television show that's been able to hang around for 10 seasons. And The Walking Dead has not just been hanging around. It, you know, one time it was the number one show on television and it still pulls in pretty good ratings. If you're owned by something like Universal Studios or Disney, they will eventually create a theme park attraction or uh, develop a video game or do both. And in The Walking Dead's case, they've done both. So along those lines, there is an attraction at Universal Studios called The Walking Dead. And an actor who worked at The Walking Dead attraction at Universal Studios alleges, and this is in Hollywood, alleges that visitors repeatedly attacked and groped cast members and that the theme park did little or nothing to stop it. Kirk Logan filed a lawsuit this past Wednesday in Los Angeles Superior Court alleging that he was repeatedly punched by theme park guests. He also said numerous female co-workers were groped and sexually assaulted. Now, I support neither... Uh, types of assault. It's not cor correct assault anybody under any circumstances, whether it just be a violent assault or a sexual assault, which is also the worst kind of violence. The attraction was based on the popular AMC show. Guests walk through a post-apocalyptic environment with dark and narrow corridors where actors portraying zombies would startle them. The suit contends that Universal Studios encouraged the assault in its marketing materials, which told visitors, prepare to fight for survival. Okay. Now, I have never worked in a theme park, thank goodness. Uh, although I know plenty of, I had friends who did, who worked at Six Flags in Atlanta, Six Flags over Georgia. It wasn't in the Atlanta city limits, but it was outside of Atlanta. And these particular friends worked in games. <laughs> this is back in the 80s, early 80s. They, they worked there from high school going into college. So they worked in the late 70s, early 80s, and they embezzled money out of those days. Life was much different back then. I think they counted on the employees to steal some of that money. Anyway, the the thing is, is that 
there were always people who used to violate the mascots at these theme parks. I had, you know, my friends of friends who worked in these places, they always have somebody dressed up as a particular cartoon character. I heard this happen a lot in Disneyland. There's always the wise guy who wants to punch Mickey Mouse or do something like that. However, they, you know, that, and that's not good, but this is not a new phenomenon. What is, I think, a little different about this situation. Oh, let me go, let me bring something else up. There are people I know who have punched people in haunted houses that come spring up like around Halloween because they got startled. And it's just almost a natural reflex that somebody jumps out from behind a corner and you're not ready for it. If you are the type of, it's a fight or flight reflex. Some people fight. Some people run, but it happens. So I think this is something that they should have been, they should have expected from jump. And in fact, if they didn't want this to happen to their employees, they should warn the guests that this will not be tolerated. And they should also have people watching them. So I think the lawsuit, while I would think if I dressed up like a zombie and jumped out from behind a, a tree or something to scare them, I would be ready for, for action. Um, they still, this should not be, this should not have happened. In fact, yeah, if I was a zombie and somebody punched me, they would be prepared to fight for their survival. Anyway, Universal, according to this article, quote, Universal actually incites its guests to fight the employees, end quote. The lawsuit states, a Universal Studios Hollywood spokesman declined to respond to the specific allegations. Quote, we don't comment on pending lit- litigations. That's smart. However, the safety and security of our employees and guests is always our top priority, the spokesperson said. The Walking Dead attraction opened in 2016 and it closed last month, shortly before the entire park was shut down due to the coronavirus outbreak. The suit notes that alcohol is served in the park and that guests would often be drunk. Logan alleges that a guest punched him in the face in July of 2019. In August of 2019, he says another guest punched him several times and he was ultimately prosecuted. In the, a third incident, Logan alleges a guest punched him in the stomach in January. When he reported the assault to a supervisor, he was told to take a short break and then go back to work. Okay. <laughs> Logan either is into the zombie stuff so much that he'll just take personal abuse or he hasn't figured out that you jump out and scare people in a zombie costume, you're going to get punched eventually. You're going to get punched. The suit states that several female cast members reported numerous incidents when guests would grope their breasts or buttocks. On one occasion, actor Lisa Molina was in a cage and a guest reached in and grabbed her breast. She said she reported the incident to her manager who told her there were things she could have done to better protect herself, according to the suit. She was in a cage, dude. Plus, it should never have happened. Another cast member, Josiah Steele, was hospitalized after a guest punched him in the face in July 2019. A lot of stuff happened in July 2019, knocking him to the ground, according to the suit. Steele complained to Human Resources and wanted to pursue prosecution, but was told that most performers don't press charges, the suit states. Wow, they just said, suck it up, dude. Steele had complained two years ago about the situation and had asked for changes to protect the employees, the suit states. My question is, all right, number one, let me get this straight. Number one, this should never have happened. These guests of the park were out of line. They shouldn't go in there hitting the, the employees, and they definitely shouldn't be groping the female, well, any of the employees, but the female employees especially. That's just ridiculous, and those guys should be prosecuted. Those are jerks. But my question is about the nature of the job. Once we get past this legal thing, it's like if I'm the guy's attorney, I'm going to prosecute this to the fullest extent of the law, sue Universal, get this guy and woman and whoever else is involved, their just compensation and desserts for having been abused this way and not having the park protect them. After that, (laughs) after I get my fee, I'm taking them aside and saying, what in the world did you expect to happen? If you're jumping out at in mass, I mean, 
if you, I would imagine, I'm surprised they didn't get punched every day. Okay, that's that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm the groping. That's some stupid, childish, perverted stuff that should never happen. You can't credibly say I was scared into groping her. I was startled, so I grabbed her buttocks. That all of that stuff is way out of line. However, I'm I you know I'm not in, in a violent person. I truly am not. However, I cannot say that 100 percent of the time. If I'm walking through walking dead land and somebody jumps out with a decayed face and scares me, I don't do something to get that person away from me. And it may end up being something like an act like a punch or a shove or something like that. It seems like that is what they're encouraging to happen. This is a, and, 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 and like a long story short, this attraction is a terrible idea. I know it sounded good, but unless you have people sign waivers on both sides, you're going to get a lawsuit just like you got right here because somebody is going to hit somebody else, period. It just seems like that's the way it would go, especially when they say that, you know, exactly like the lawsuit said, especially if it's marketed like you're going to fight for your survival. So anyway, I saw this article. I thought it was an interesting story. I just, anything associated with The Walking Dead cracks me up i just it's it's amazing to me that it's been so successful and again i applaud the people i applaud them who have been doing this i'm not hating the player but in this case i really don't understand the game they were caught slipping on this one this was this was a terrible idea next i'm going to talk about the long-term effects of this recession on our viewing habits and what might happen to the industry get another drink don't go away i'll be right back Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Okay. Y'all all right? You washing your hands? Did you wash your hands? We are back. And this whole COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in has changed the way we go to live our lives day to day. We're all stuck in the house. As we've discussed on this show, many of us watch more television. But the question in the future is going to be is how we are going to get or choose to get our TV. Because our habits have changed in this short period of time. You know, as sports leagues go dark and, you know, series production halts, Some analysts are predicting that cord cutting, you know, severing your ties with whoever, whatever big cable provider you get your services from, it's going to start to accelerate as the value proposition of keeping them or not falls apart. You know, people across the U.S., as I said, are stuck in their homes. And with the spread of the coronavirus, what impact is that going to have on this cord cutting phenomenon? Now, Wall Street types, the bullish ones, They highlight the fact that news and entertainment provided by paid TV operators are key sources of information and distraction during times like this. Comcast, for example, they said that on March 30th, well, in a report that they released on March 30th, that TV consumption in its homes has increased by four hours uh, per week. It used to be 60 hours a week. People will watch TV, which is already a lot, but it increased four hours. I'm sure now it's probably even more. Video on demand usage has hit record highs, according to them. Now, that increased usage could potentially slow down the exodus that a lot of people had been making from pay TV. They uh, had suffered a lot of subscriber losses. And in 2019, they hit an all time high. 4.9 million people left their providers 
like Comcast or Cox or Verizon or DirecTV. Uh, that number came from this group called the Leachman Research Group. They do a lot of, uh, they, they look at the television industry and they provide not only ratings information, but information that has to do with how we consume TV. So I look at them a lot. I think it's pretty interesting. But with economists now expecting a recession in the wake of this viral crisis or the virus crisis and unemployment on the rise, consumers, you and I, may soon find that we may not be able to afford the cable bill. Uh, we are going to have to probably all make some cuts and, as they say, tighten our belts in the next couple of, uh, in the next year or so. I was going to say actually in the next couple of months, but, in, you know, maybe probably over the next year. Unless you you are happen to be in a sector that is essential, as they say. Now, I make most of my money in real estate right now. Wish I had made it on podcast, but right now I'm making it in real estate. We are considered, I'm in the state of Maryland, we're considered an essential business. However, my business has slowed down because it's a social business. Even though um, we're still per- permitted to work and show real estate, it's we have to jump through a lot more hoops. I mean, you have to keep the social distance. You can only have a certain number of people in the house. You can't have open houses anymore. All of these things have affected my business in a negative sense, meaning it's slowed down. And I will probably make less money this year than I've been used to making. So uh, even though I have, I'm in an essential business, I'll have to make some decisions, some budgeting decisions. That doesn't count the people that have totally lost their jobs. Some people are going to have no income except for these stimulus checks or unemployment insurance or a job that's going to get, make them less money than they were making before this viral virus outbreak. So uh, what or what's it going to look like? Where are people going to get their television? Now, the fact that sports leagues and TV show production has also been put on hold will make pay TV even seem like less of a value compared with alternatives like streaming. You know, that's that's something that I never really thought about. I, I guess consciously was that because I still have Verizon Fios. That's my cable provider. And it's expensive. You know, I've been considering cutting the cable several times. One of the things that I, I was taking into consideration I don't want to say it was number one, but it probably was up there. And I didn't realize it was that I had access to sports. Now, news, I like to try to pretend like I'm more cerebral. So I say, oh, well, I want local news and I want this. And like, you can get local news from other sources, but it was just much more easier. You can tell I'm cerebral because I say more easier. Uh, it's much easier to get it from the cable provider. But most people kept their cable service or direct TV that have these packages where you have the NFL package or major league baseball or whatever, because they wanted access to those sporting leagues. Those leagues are no longer around right now. And we don't know when they're going to get back to normal. So now you're paying a big bill every month for entertainment that's not being provided to you. So people are going to start cutting the cord, as they say. Comcast also said in that March 30th, Report Now, understand, March 30th, again, even though we were in the coronavirus uh, outbreak, you know, they, we weren't at the place where we are now where every state in the union has been declared a disaster area and almost every state has stay-at-home orders. That wasn't the case on March 30th. Back in March 30th, they said that video game downloads were up 50% and that streaming and web video consumption had increased 38%. But that was back then and this is now and now more people have lost jobs and more things look more dire in the short run some people on wall street they've increased their pay tv subscriber loss forecast for 2020 they thought it was going to go up because it had been going up from the 4.9 million that were lost in 2019 now they think it's going to be even greater than that in 2020 there could initially be some benefit from the fact that people have been stuck at home and that they are glued to cable news, but it won't last. Moffat Nathanson analyst Craig Moffat tells The Hollywood Reporter, the financial pre- pressures of the COVID recession will inevitably push consumers to economize, so cord cutting will accelerate. 
That will only be exacerbated by the lack of sports programming. Sports are the glue that holds the bundle together. Without sports, the value proposition for pay TV starts to fall apart, end quote. And I totally agree with that. That's what I was just saying. And I think that people are going to start dropping their cable bills. I mean, I was contemplating this long before I even even thought a pandemic was in the in the realm of possibility. And it was because the alternatives seemed more attractive. You know, do I really need to, I don't really find myself watching sports from play ball to the last out anymore. I don't. So I was wondering what's, if it's valuable enough for me to, to be paying that. And would I rather have HBO Max when it comes out? And those are the things I was weighing before this. And I think a lot of the market was the same way. Cable operators have a new core business, and that's broadband. And that is likely to benefit from the coronavirus pandemic. Because when you cut the cord, you're going to have to stream. So as internet connections are enabling work through Zoom and entertainment for uh, more entertainment options for people that are stuck at home, usage of Netflix, YouTube, and other streaming platforms has jumped during this time. So uh, I've been, you know, the reason I'm going over this is because I could relate to this stuff because while the cable that I get from Verizon Fios has been adequate, there are times when I wish I had a little bit more uh, speed. So I would think rather than uh, purchasing another pay channel, I would drop the pay channel and increase my internet speed and, um, you know, just benefit from some of these other alternatives. You know, some of these experts have argued that broadband providers could see more pricing power after this crisis. So you might find that you're going to be paying more for broadband too, just because the law of price and demand. I don't see the demand for broadband or data consumption lessening in a meaningful way post COVID-19. I don't. So I think that's going to be the state of the market in the short run and probably evolving into what most of the people streaming than not streaming in the long run. So that's my little update of the market. It's something to think about as you decide what you're going to do in the future about how and where you get your television or your home entertainment. Next, I'm going to talk about, guess what? Television on broadcast. (laughs) I have a list of the shows that got renewed for next season and those that got canceled for next season. And if I have enough time, I'll go over a list of some shows that you might watch that we don't know what's going to happen. And I'll tell you what I think is going to happen based on what I know. And we'll be right back with that. Stick around. Thanks for listening. Go get a drink. You ready, Jack? Let's do it. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. You got it? All right. I am back. And uh, I'm going to make it a lot easier this segment. We're not going to be talking about a whole bunch of numbers or about the industry shutting down. I just have a simple list of some shows that are going to be renewed or are scheduled to be renewed and those that are that have got canceled on the four broadcast networks, NBC, ABC, CBS, And Fox, and maybe the CW also, if we have time to do that. So I'm going to get right to it. On NBC, these are the shows that have been renewed for next season or maybe the summer. And I have them in alphabetical order. No particular order, but they are alphabetical. You have America's Got Talent, which is going to maybe have a summer premiere, depending on how things go with uh, production. American Ninja Warrior, again, it might have a summer premiere. The Blacklist, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Chicago Fire, a Dick Wolf production, 
it got three more seasons. Chicago Med, three more seasons. Chicago PD, three more seasons. Dick Wolf. Ellen's Game of Games is going to be renewed, or was renewed. Law and Order SVU. Dick Wolf, three more seasons. Making It got renewed. New Amsterdam, three more seasons. Dick Wolf. Songland is going to be a show that's got a season, a summer premiere, renewed. Superstore, This Is Us. This Is Us got two more seasons. That's pretty good, but not Dick Wolf style. And last but not least, The Wall was renewed on NBC. These two shows got canceled. The In-Between and Sunnyside. I haven't seen neither of those shows. Probably a good... A, it's an indicator of why they might have gotten canceled. Um, one show that's moving to the Peacock, which is going to be their streaming service, is AP Bio. Another show I've never seen, but it's now it's going to be on their streaming service. Three shows that are ending. They had their series finales. All of them were successful. The Blind Spot, The Good Place, and the reboot of Will and Grace. All of them are ending. Now we're moving to ABC. These shows have been renewed. The $100,000 Pyramid. This is another classic Dick of, well, this, he's no longer with us, but he started this show, Mr. Dick Clark. So when you call somebody a dick in the TV industry, it is not an insult. America's Funniest Home Videos. The cockroach zombie of television still around. The Bachelorette. It's currently on hold. They want to premiere it this summer, but it's coming, it's coming on your TV soon. Bachelor in Paradise, uh, another Bachelor spinoff. Uh, it's, it's a summer premiere currently on hold as well. Card Sharks, Celebrity Family Feud, <laughs> The Good Doctor, Grey's Anatomy, another zombie that will never go away. Holy Moly, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it's the final season for that. Match Game, Press Your Luck, Station 19, which is a spinoff, I believe, of Grey's Anatomy, and To Tell the Truth, that I didn't know that they had brought back, but they did, I guess. Those are all been renewed. Canceled on ABC is Grand Hotel and Reef Break. Not familiar with any of those shows. Reef Break sounds like it's a... Some kind of cheap knockoff of Point Break. No wonder it's gone. Probably not a good show. Probably why it's in the can. Trash can, that is. And ending their run on ABC. Fresh Off the Boat. How to Get Away with Murder. And Modern Family. The latter two big successes. Modern Family. Iconic comedy. Okay. Now we go to CBS. On CBS. These these shows have been renewed. Big Brother <laughs> has a summer premiere, maybe. That's when they wanted to start it. It's on hold. Big Brother is another one of those that's just going to be around, I think, as long as the reality genre lasts. Blood and Treasure. Summer premiere. I'm assuming that's a reality show. Not familiar with Blood and Treasure. CBS show. Evil, a show that has my boy Mike Coulter from Luke Cage. And Katya Erbers, I believe is how you pronounce her name, she plays, uh, she's from Westworld. She played, uh, William the Man in Black's daughter, who he shot down in cold blood. But she did a great job. Never seen that show, but I like the actors who star in it. Love Island got renewed. Summer premiere, supposedly. Mom was renewed. Young Sheldon was renewed as well. That show looks annoying to me, but it gets both good numbers, so God bless them. And so far, CBS has canceled none of their shows. Uh, but there's a long list of shows I'm looking at. I don't have time to go over of 20 to 25 shows that, uh, a good percentage of, in my opinion, probably will get canceled, but they need to keep something on the air. So not all of them will get canceled. The Amazing Race has not, it, it was renewed. It has not premiered yet, but they have some in the can. They're getting ready. They're going to put them on whenever they can. Three shows that are ending their run. Criminal Minds, Hawaii Five-0, without the real Steve McGarrett, Jack Lord, and Madam Secretary. All three of those are ending their runs. Now we go to Fox. 
what's been renewed at Fox. Beat Shazam, which is the Jamie Foxx game show. Good for Jamie. He probably uses that to buy another house. Bless the Hearts, Duncanville, Hell's Kitchen, The Simpsons. That is the ultimate zombie of all shows. That will never go away, I think, unless they just get tired of drawing them. And So You Think You Can Dance, which was also scheduled for a summer premiere. Who knows when it's going to be on now. Canceled, Almost Family. That was that horrendous show about the doctor with the frozen sperm babies all over the nation, or all over the world, I guess. BH90210, which I guess is the reboot of the reboot of Beverly Hills 90210. That's going to the well one too many times. Canceled. And Deputy, which I talked about last show, a formulaic cop procedural show that could have been pulled off by Dick Wolf, but it gets canceled in other people's hands. Some shows on Fox that haven't premiered yet, but they're returning are Filthy Rich, The Great North Animated Show, Mental Samurai, Next, and Ultimate Tag. All of those are going to be coming, but the date has not been set. The Orville was moved to Hulu. That used to be on Fox, but now it's going to be on Hulu for those of you who have it. And the show that's ending its run on Fox is Empire. Thank you very much, Fox. Thank you for taking that show off the air. Finally. Last but not least, The CW. I don't have much time left, but I want to say, this is what I like about The CW. They know what kind of shows go on The CW. They're not great shows, but they're entertaining. They have about the same flavor. It just depends what kind of what kind of show you want to watch, whether it's a soap opera show or a, a superhero show. But anyway, here are the shows that are being renewed. All-American, Batwoman, Black Lightning, Burden of Truth, Charmed, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Dynasty, The Flash, In the Dark, Legacies, Nancy Drew, The Outpost, Pandora, Riverdale, Roswell, New Mexico, and Supergirl. All of those shows have about the same flavor, just different types of protagonists. And that's why I like the CW. They know what they're doing. They're not trying to break any records. They're just putting out content that people will watch when they want to kill 60 minutes of their life. Canceled. Nothing on the CW has been canceled yet because they have some, they have, uh, they have shows that people like, you know, for what they are. Anyway, ending on the CW, three shows, the 100, didn't watch, Arrow, I did watch, I thought it was a good show, a couple of the seasons were kind of lame, but all in all, very good show. All of those superhero shows that I named previously were spinoffs of Arrow. So if that tells you Arrow was a great foundational show, people went for it who were acting on it. I give it much respect, even though it's not for everybody. Last but not least on this list, Supernatural is ending its run. Had a good, respectful run on the CW. Didn't watch it. But I guarantee it's a lot like All American or The Flash or anything on CW, on the CW, except for it dealt with witches. So, all right, that's it for this segment. I hope you found it informative. Hope that'll help you set your broadcast viewing expectations for this season coming up whenever things start rolling again. But next, we're going to go over episode five of season three of Westworld, entitled Genre. Don't go away. We'll be right back with a few hosts in Westworld. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Okay. All right. One more, Jack. I am back. And listen, before I get started, I want to let you know there is another episode of Tiger King. You probably know that already. It's one Joel McHale put together. I am not going to talk about it. Maybe next show, but not this episode. You can thank me 
later. Last night, Westworld crossed the halfway point of its eight-episode season into episode five. The title of that episode is called Genre, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it right now. Uh, again, I'm going to try to avoid the blow-by-blow, blow, even though I get, I'm get i guilty of doing that often. I'm just going to talk about the wider concept of it, and uh, I'd like to hear what you all think about it. The, na- the name of the episode, Genre, is the name of a designer drug that Liam was given a dose of from his friend at the Eyes Wide Shut auction orgy show last episode. However, Liam didn't have an opportunity to take it before he was kidnapped by Bernard and Stubbs, and ultimately he was scooped up by Dolores and Caleb, and so that's where we left him at the end of last show. This show, he is still with Dolores and Caleb when it opens up, and Liam injects Caleb with the genre drug in an attempt to escape. And the rest of the episode, we are swept along with Caleb in this cinema-like dreamscape whenever we're having a scene with Caleb in it. Uh, The drug allows the user, and this is according to Giggles, (laughs) <laughs> Marshawn Lynch's character allows the user to experience life in different movie genres, uh, kind of like a movie marathon in five acts. So the episode morphs into these different acts. The first one being like this black and white film noir uh, spy type of thing. And the, it's very well done. It's a bit gimmicky, but it's very slick, very well directed. However, it's rescued from being a little bit too slick or being stupid by a fantastic soundtrack, which like I've said before, if you don't like the plot, (laughs) which some people don't, or the special effects of Westworld, you should still watch Westworld for the music alone. It is excellent. And the acting as well. I love acting as those of you who listen to me know. This episode is very key And I think, again, this has been an up and down season. This is one of those swagger episodes where I believe Westworld got its swagger back. And uh, Ciroc, Vincent Casal's character, is finally given a backstory. We learn a little bit more about Ciroc. We're given the backstory with his brother and the bomb going off in Paris and all of that. I'm not going to get into that as much. But we are introduced to Liam's father. Uh, and how he entered the scene when they first started uh, working on putting together an AI, which, in their words, was going to be the god that man needed. Sorak says when they built the different iterations of this AI, David, then Solomon, and then Rehobo, there were problems. You know, there were things that Rehobo couldn't predict, and they needed more data. So they teamed up with Liam Dempsey Sr., who, as you all know, watch the show, is the owner of Insight. And that Insight company, uh, it, it collects data from the rest of the world, much like, I guess, Facebook does. Um, and so it had the, all this data about all the people of the world at its disposal. So when they hooked up with, with uh, Dempsey and Dempsey's money in particular and Dempsey's information from his uh, company, they would be able to hopefully complete this AI, make it more uh, reliable, and smooth out some of the hard edges. But problems persisted still. So after they created the Solomon version, which was the version that preceded Rehobo, (laughs) which was the one that they showed to uh, Liam Dempsey originally, 18 months after that, Dempsey confronted them, the two brothers, Sorak and his other brother, uh, that said that he didn't like the, they were still having, they couldn't make great predictions. And so he wasn't satisfied with the outcomes. And so he's going to pull out his money, even though he said, you know, they were having progress and Sorak was saying they were having good progress with predicting the past or, 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 you know, knowing, taking this information and knowing what had happened in the past. That wasn't what Dempsey was looking for. So to make a long story short, short, Sorak shows him that Rehobo can predict the stock market with great accuracy. And he made Dempsey a fortune. And that's what persuaded him to keep his investment involved in it and, and in the project and kept them, let them move forward. So he stayed in. 
Uh, he made, uh, uh, in just in one day, a hundred million dollars out of five million dollars, which Sorok stole from someone else through this system. So he was very impressed with it. He's very greedy. So he stayed in. Unfortunately, there were still these outliers that Rehobo <laughs> couldn't predict. And it really bothered Sorok. And he knew that, well, he was convinced that one day the whole system would crash if he didn't act against these outliers. So 10 years after this relationship with Dempsey started up again, Dempsey discovered that Sorok had this little like mental institution of sorts where he's keeping these outlier people. So the way Sorok thought he should solve this problem, he could solve this problem is to remove these outliers from society. Because if he got rid of the outliers, then Rehobo could accurately predict and even direct people's futures. But these outliers were messing things up. So he put them in uh, this institution of sorts and he could either get them back in line so that they wouldn't be out of outliers or they would just have to stay in there. And one of the people that he put in this institution was his brother because his brother was, yes, very brilliant, but he could not be controlled or predicted. So therefore, Sorak said he needed to be in this institution. So Sorak is basically a type of Nazi, kind of. Uh, you know, he does make these decisions, these very executive decisions that some people can stay in society and some people cannot. And those that stay in society, he directs their future. So he cleanses the world of people he considers outliers, which I think is a very PC way of call him calling them mentally ill because they are unstable in his system. And uh, his predictive algorithm will not work if these people are allowed to stay in society. He's worried the whole world is going to fall apart if they're allowed to stay. Meanwhile, Dolores is still trying to eradicate the future of humankind. She doesn't discriminate from great people or from terrible people or from little people. She wants all people gone. So what she does is she allows them to see what their futures are according to Rehobo. And chaos ensues. Dolores is kind of analogous to our current pandemic. She is the virus that is trying to wipe out the world. I'm not trying to be overdramatic. I'm just trying to put it in place where you can kind of relate to it. Dolores is finding, at least in her plan, I believe in spreading this truth and how these, how you've been manipulated, society's been manipulated by Insight and Rehobo that they will fight back against it. And we start seeing the beginnings of that during this episode. Uh, Bernard is still in the mix. He thinks he's part of this plan. And Stubbs, as I predicted last year, last week, he does show up and save the day. At the end of episode five, it well, it, it's clear one one thing is clear at the end of episode five, as far as I'm concerned, that Dolores's motivations and Sorak's motivations, whether you agree with them or not, or what they're doing or not, their motivations are pure. Sorak thinks he's doing something that is going to be that's in the best interest of the world. Dolores, even though she is motivated by vengeance and she is very upset at mankind, she sees mankind as as a disease and that she thinks exterminating them would be the best thing. So the show comes down to who will control our future. Dolores, the man-made virus, or the tech billionaire who thinks he knows what's best for everyone else. And in the middle of this conflict is the poor everyman Caleb, who are learning is more than he appears to be as well. So that is it for my recap of Westworld, Episode 5. thought it was a good episode. I would encourage you all to watch the show. Just watch it. And that's it for this episode <laughs> of the Golden State Media Concepts television podcast. We're part of the mighty Golden State Media Concepts podcast network. I want you to please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you would, please go to iTunes or especially to Apple Podcasts and, and subscribe. Please give us a five-star rating. Mention me in the comments, if you will. Email me at podcasthoward at gmail.com. Take care of yourselves. Stay inside. Wash your hands. Wear a mask while shopping. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. See you next time.
Bye bye. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies. To music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.